and Ruthie. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so before I get started, I wanted to play a little snippet of a radio broadcast um, with a man who is the reason why um, I'm teaching this on suffering. And so I'm going to play, it's like a three minute audio snippet and then we'll get started, okay?
And I just ask that as we go to your word, as we study, Lord, through your eyes, through your lens of scripture, this whole idea and this whole um, theology of suffering, God, that we would come away a people more comforted, that we would come away with a new sense of our hope in you, and God, that the wounds that perhaps haven't fully healed, Lord, would begin to heal. We just surrender this time to you, and I just pray, Father, that my words would fall away and be forgotten, but God, that your word would remain in our hearts. So we just give this time to you in your name. Amen. Uh, the man that you heard um, speaking about his wife who had cancer, losing a son um, when he was a month old and having a heart attack, was the same man who came to Moody Bible Institute where I did my undergrad. And he came about the same time I had come. Um, I tried to take as many theology classes with this man because as you heard, he had been through the fire. And um, even though he had been a pastor for many years, he was in the midst of feeling this suffering. So when I found out that he was teaching a course on suffering, I had to take it. And I can honestly say of all the different classes that I've taken, um, this was the one that I would always walk away feeling ministered to, ministered by. I, you know, it wasn't just about all the, the, the um, books I had to read or the papers I had to write or the facts I had to memorize, but it really um, spoke to my heart and about certain suffering that I had dealt with um, as an adolescent. And so um, I wanted to write a study based on that course. And so throughout the Bible study, you will see me quoting him quite a bit because this is really, I used his notes as kind of the skeleton for this Bible um, study. So I just wanted you to hear a little bit of his heart and kind of where the study is coming from. Um, I want to give you really quickly the outline of what the next six weeks are going to look like. It's not in um, what I've written there, but just so that you kind of have a heads up. Um, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the paradise, about the pre-fall before everything starts happening with suffering. So kind of looking at the relationship that God had with Adam and Eve. Uh, this week, you will go through um, the fall. You're going to look at, look at the temptation and the tempter and, and what was all involved with the fall. Uh, next Monday, when we come back together, I'm going to be teaching on the entrance of sin and suffering and how the fall was kind of that gateway into um, suffering. And then next week, we'll be studying the book of Job. And this one, this week is going to be, that week when we study the book of Job, it's going to be a lot of work. And so um, I'm going to just encourage you to get whatever done that you can get done and come back. Um, we're going to go through the whole book, so it's 42 chapters. So I realize it's a lot. You usually do a, a Bible study just on Job, and so we're just kind of doing an overhead view. But we are going to read through the book of Job next week. We come back the third week, we're going to be talking about the sovereign God in our suffering and how, you know, if God is in control of all things, um, how, is he, how does he play a role in my suffering? Then we're going to um, be studying the life of David and the Psalms and suffering. The fourth week or fifth week, we're going to be looking at the suffering of Jesus Christ. And because of his ultimate suffering, we look forward to the day when we will suffer no more. And so looking at, at his suffering. And then we'll look at God's plan in defeating suffering, which is what we all look forward to the most. And then our last week we'll be talking about how do we minister to those who are currently going through suffering. So that's kind of the overview of what we're going to be looking at these next six weeks. Um, this is the very first study I've ever written, and so I know you women will be very gracious and kind with me. Um, I'm not Beth Moore or Kay Arthur or <laughs> any of those greats, and so um, for some of you, 
you know, you enjoy journaling. Some of you enjoy filling in the blank. Um, I, I have a difficult time doing Bible studies, and this is my own my own thing. I, I just, I tend to wait till the last, like, couple days, and then I fill everything in so that I have something to talk about. I'm going to be completely honest with you. And so I wanted this, I really want you to be able to kind of reflect. There's going to be, every week will look a little different. So there'll be some weeks where I'm going to ask you to journal a little bit. There's going to be some weeks um, where you're going to do a lot of observation. And what I mean by that is I'll say, give me 10 observations over this chapter that you read. And observations are simply something that you notice that kind of pops out at you. Um, this was a really big deal. We were at Moody and at Dallas. Um, we had Dr. Howard Hendricks. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He passed away a few years ago. Um, but he was really into certain methodical Bible study methods. And I remember when we took his course, this is like what he makes everybody that goes through Dallas Seminary do if you take his course is we had to look at Acts 1.8, one verse. And we had to write 25 observations on one verse. Then, you turned it in, and he says, I want you to write 25 more observations on that one verse. So now we're at 50 observations on one verse. Then we turn that in, and he said, I want 25 more observations on one verse. And I think he said that after 75 observations, that's all he required, but he had one student do like 200 observations on one verse. So I know that it can be done, and I, I'm not going to be like that with you, I'm not going to be rigid, but I'm going to have you really observe the text and um, just write out things that kind of pop your pop out to you. Um, okay. The other thing I wanted to say is that I realize each of us are in different seasons of our life. And I remember when we, Rick and I went to um, a pastor's conference with Pastor Tom and Mary and Pastor Nick and Christy in the fall, and one of the seminars I took was for um, pastor's wives, and, and the speaker's wife spoke, and she said something to, or to the group that really hit me, and she said, you know, there are seasons of your life when Bible study will look a little different. Um, she says, I remember, because they had like five children, so she said, in my 30s, when we were having all these little kids, you know, people would ask me, you know, what does God teach you in his word? And she says, do you know what? To be honest, I spend maybe three minutes in God's word, and I'm just growing his babies. Like, that's, that's the season of life I'm in. And it, like, gave me a little bit of comfort because I do work, I do have a two-year-old. Um, and so, not that, you know, that's like an excuse. However, it's the season of life that I'm in. And for every season that we're in, God teaches us different things, and our, our Bible study time and our prayer time will look different. And so I want you to have a little bit of liberty in that. That the season of life I'm in, you know, I have a two-hour window when Emma takes a nap. That's my only time. That's when I take a shower. That's when I do the dishes. It's also the time that I have time with the Lord. But that's going to look different, you know, in 20 years when my, you know, she's out of the house. And so I just want you to have a little bit of comfort in that if you do have younger children, that I want you to be able to enjoy this study, to kind of just take a deep breath and reflect. And if you don't get everything filled out, it's okay. Come back and um, let us minister to you. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, it really encouraged me. Lastly, before I get started, I want to give a few ground rules with Bible study. Um, I don't know if you guys usually do this beforehand. I have, I've, since we've only been here a year, I haven't been in one of your Bible studies yet. But this was something that we would do in other churches. A few ground rules about, especially this subject of suffering. Uh, it's a very sensitive topic. It's going to bring up a lot of different emotions. Uh, perhaps some things that you've struggled with in the past that you're like, I'm okay, I'm fine with. I'm done with that, maybe start kind of coming up again. Um, and I want this time and this place to be a safe place. You know, I'm all about confidentiality and making sure that the things that are said here, that are talked about here, stay here because um, the church should be the place that we can open up about 
hard things. And unfortunately, the church has kind of become the place where I have to kind of save face and I have to make sure I have everything together, which is so like ironic because the church is for broken people. And so just, I want you to be able to, if things are said here, that you keep it here. I mean, obviously be praying for each other outside of here, but just keep it here. As well as, I really encourage you to be able to share things with your group. Obviously, as Carol said, if there's some things that are just too hard to talk about, you know, write it down. You don't have to share it right now. But I would encourage you to find at least one person that you could share with about some of these struggles. Um, you know, the way that we can do this study is we can kind of do the overview and fill in the blanks. But if it really isn't touching us or if it really isn't bringing stuff out, um, it's kind of useless. And so I really, I, again, you don't have to share here, but at least share these things with the Lord. Write these things down and make sure that um, this place is, is safe. And so I just wanted to throw that out there. All right. So well, let's go ahead and get started. So we have the first page in front of you. And these are my notes. And so basically, I'm just going to be talking through every little thing on here. I wanted you to have my notes so that if people weren't here, they would have it. You have some of the references. I'm going to give you more references as we go through, um, but just so that you don't have to be writing everything down. It's kind of already there for you. Okay, so I'm just going to read the beginning. Many of us have ideas of what suffering means, what it looks like, and what it feels like. We have faces in our minds of people who have suffered or are currently suffering. Suffering seems to touch everyone, to affect anyone, and no one is immune. To have a biblical understanding of suffering is important when we go through seasons of suffering or when we are ministering to those who are going through it. In this study, I want to kind of peel back those layers of suffering, to see suffering through the lens of Scripture, and to process the biblical examples of suffering. So in the times when I suffer and you suffer, and it seems very unbearable. We can take comfort in God and in his word. So there's ten different views of suffering. And I want you to be completely honest. Okay. Ne next to each one of these, if you've ever felt this, just kind of put a little check. Okay. And maybe you've never felt any of these, and that's totally fine too. Okay, so the first one is people think God wants us to suffer. People think God wants us to suffer. Um, kind of an image that I always get is like an ogre in the sky that's just waiting for me to mess up or me to trip up. He wants us to suffer. The second view can be people think if we have person if we have personally done something wrong, they will suffer. People think if they have personally done something wrong, they will suffer. If I do something bad. I'm going to suffer. Number three, suffering is karma. Now, obviously, we're not, we don't necessarily, we don't believe in karma, but this idea that what goes around comes around. If you do something bad to somebody else, oh, it's going to come get you tenfold. That's karma. Number four, people think you can avoid suffering if you're good. Just like as we listen to Dr. Finch, you know, if I'm good, if I do what God says, if I, I'm pleasing to him, then I can avoid it. I don't have to suffer. Five, people think only the weak suffer. And this is one um, topic that I wish I could do a whole session on this one um, because I think a lot of times in our society especially, which kind of trickles into our church, that people who have suffered are, are deemed weak. They're not strong in the Lord. They're, you know, they're just weak. And I think this really goes not just for physical, but psychological or emotional suffering. Um, if, I'm, if I have depression or if I have anxiety, I'm not strong in the Lord and I'm weak. And therefore, like, I'm like this leper that nobody wants to be around. Okay, number six. People think God is just waiting for us to mess up, so we'll suffer. It's kind of like the first one, God wants us to suffer, but he's just waiting for us to mess up. Seven. 
People think God wants, this is kind of like the first one, people think God wants and delights in our suffering. You know, a lot of times if we have a view of God that is distorted, um, but if we look at him in the Old Testament, we're like, see, he just, he wanted to annihilate them. He, he desired that they would fall so that he could discipline them. Um, you know, does God really delight in our suffering? Number eight, people think God directly causes us to suffer. Now, this one is a little tricky, um, and I put directly causes um, because I think in a secondary sense, yes, God does cause some suffering in our lives, but this whole directly causes, um, I would have to disagree with. People think God directly causes. And by the way, I disagree with all of these, <laughs> just so you know. Um, but these are things that I've thought and I have believed over time. Nine, people think God is not affected by my suffering or by our suffering. People think God is not affected by our suffering. It doesn't bother him one way or another if I suffer. He's just up there, you know, he's not involved in my life, and if I suffer, he, he doesn't care. And lastly, 10, people think, oh, this is the same thing, people think God doesn't care when I suffer. People think God doesn't care when we suffer. So these are 10 just kind of Blanket statements about suffering um, that maybe you've thought of, I know I've thought of, especially when you're in the midst of suffering and you feel like God is silent and He is nowhere, we can begin to believe. So let's go ahead and begin uh, Biblical Theology of Suffering. Dr. Finch says, we're not talking about the philosophy of suffering, but the reality of suffering. And he says that throughout this because... Like he said in the in the audio, it, he understood this idea of suffering even as a pastor, but it wasn't until it actually affected him that it became a reality, that it became part of um, his belief and part of who he was it, because it affected him. So number one, biblical understanding of suffering is based on scripture, God's revelation, and God's perspective. A biblical understanding of suffering is based on scripture, God's revelation, and God's perspective. Whenever we talk about a biblical theology, it's just, it's just that. It's scripture. It's looking at um, a theology through the lens of scripture, God's revelation, his perspective. When we suffer, we tend to see things through distortion, and it can become unclear. So when we have a biblical theology... When we go through that suffering, we have the right way to look at it. The pre-suffering man, the origin of man, the, bo the backdrop that we're going to be talking about today is paradise. The creation in which Adam and Eve lived in the beginning was with God. He is not bound by time or space. We see in Genesis that it is God who is the creator with all power. General, and, and then I'm going to read Romans 1.20. You'll see... Here, as well as there's another place, there's a little question mark. I didn't edit that when I we printed it out, but those question marks you could just get rid of. They should. That is the right passage. So if you look up Romans 1.20, it talks about the power of God. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Right here, they're just talking about general revelation, that because we live in this world, we can see that there is a creator, and he is all-powerful. So if you can imagine, and I'm going to say this word a lot today, imagine, close your eyes, think about imagine, a world with no sin, a world just with the Lord, that he is completely and fully present with them. He is in control of all things. He's still in control of all things, but you really feel the weight of that. 
Okay, the first one that we're going to look at is God created order. I'm just going to read Genesis 1, 1 and 2. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surfaces of the waters. Uh, I have next to this, it was a created chaos. And what I mean by that, um, everybody didn't want me to go into all this because it's such a deep topic. But if you look into where it says formless and void, void in the, um, the ancient Near East could also be translated chaos. So out of chaos, God created. He was hovering over the chaos. Um, he is over the chaos, has power over the chaos. So you can kind of go into all that. I'm not going to, but I just, I knew it was in the notes, and I just wanted to, to say that, that God is over that. Um, number two is that he created all life. And this is going to be Genesis 2-7. I don't think this is in your notes. You can write that down, Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord God formed a man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life and the man became a living being. I love that. I love the fact that it wasn't that God just like formed him and then he woke up. It's that God actually breathed into him and gave life. That God is the sustainer and he is the giver of life. Number three, he knew good and evil. Genesis 3:22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like us, knowing good and evil. And now, and, sorry, and now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat like, and sorry, eat and live forever. Um, this is kind of getting ahead of us, but the fact that God knew good and evil and he was out without sin. Only God can know good and evil and not sin. We are not capable of that which we're going to see in this next week. But only God can know good and evil without sin. God is the basis of what we are to view as good. God works for the good of those who love him. That's Romans 8, 28. Um, everything that comes from God is good. For he was the ruler, both the provider and the sovereign. Everything is under God's control. And the reference for this is Genesis 2, 8, 9. And it says, So the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed a man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He provided everything for them, everything for life. He breathed into Adam's nostrils. He provided the food, the shelter, everything for them was provided. He gave them guidance for living. He is the lawgiver, the personal, gave them personal instruction and authority. And that would be Genesis 2, 16 through 18. It says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you shall surely die. God had instructions for them. He gave them commands. And the first command was, you can eat from every tree, but you may not eat from that one. And it wasn't just like, well, you know, don't eat from that one because it won't taste good or it's not good for you. No, because in the day that you eat that, you will die. Going back to what I said before, only God can know the knowledge of good and evil. And what they didn't realize is that by eating that fruit, the knowledge of good and evil, they were going to die now because you can't know evil without being tainted by evil. God can, but we can't. He also gave them, gave Adam instructions um, to name all the animals. If you were to go and read a little bit further down, um, he gave Adam a job to do, gave him instructions. Okay, the next part, number five, is the dichotomy. The two parts of man. We, have, we see the non-physical, the image of God in Genesis 1, 26. 
He says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This statement is pretty big that we have been created in the image of God. What does that mean, the image of God? Well, some of that can be the intellect, the fact that we have intelligence. God is an intelligent, he is intelligent. The will, God has a will, we have a will, we can make decisions. Um, there's so much more with this. I mean, it's the fact that God is emotional, we're emotional. God is spiritual and we are spiritual. The image of God, I mean, you could kind of unpack this whole thing, but those are some of the things that mean that we are created in the image of God. We know right from wrong. We, kind of, we have a conscience. Image of God. The second part is the physical, that we are a living being. And that's in Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord God formed man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. He is alive. And like I said before, God gives him life. So the next one is given life and everything for life. I said this a little bit earlier. God has prepared everything for Adam and Eve. He's also empowered them with independence. And what I mean by this, this is a quote from Dr. Finch that I'm going to read. It's actually going to be in your notes, uh, I think, this next week. So it'll be in there. But I love this quote from him. He says, our greatest liberty is being completely dependent on God. We are deceived when we think that we can have freedom and independence of God. I'll say that again. Our greatest liberty, our greatest freedom, is being completely dependent on God. And we are deceived when we think that we can have freedom and independence of God. So when I say he empowered them with independence, this is what I mean. He gave them a task to do. They were able to do different tasks but they were fully dependent on God. I know it's kind of like a, a, a paradox or it's kind of ironic what I'm saying, but they're independent, but by being independent, at, this, at the same time, they're completely dependent on Him. And that's the freest you will ever be is when you're fully dependent on God. It says that ancient Near East thought is the same as ruling the earth and being a king when he gave him the task of naming the animals. By Adam naming the animals, it showed and signified that he ruled over them, that he took care of them, but it gave him a job to do. And I just want to stay aside with this. I think it's really interesting when our husbands or men um, lose their jobs. Because if you ever notice, if a man were to lose his job, it's almost like he loses a part of him. He loses his identity. Why? Because I think God created man unique with a job and a purpose to do, to be the provider, to um, be able to take care of his family. But he gave him that desire to, to work and to and have a task. And I just think it's kind of a side note, but... Just kind of interesting to think about. If you look at men that have lost their job, they usually, you know, they can go into depression and they lose a part of their identity. And it's a, this really huge deal. And I think it's because God made them unique in having a purpose like this. So he gave them, um, he gave him the job of naming. He also gave them uh, the whole earth to go and rule. He trusted them. He also gave them choice and decision-making. And this is a, a quote by Dr. Finch. God didn't isolate Adam and Eve from the potential of making wrong decisions. I love that. Because we are made in the image of God and we have will, we, we can make choices. 
He didn't like overly protect them, make them robots, but gave them decision making so that they could make good decisions, but as we'll see this week, they can also make poor decisions, wrong decisions. Number eight, absolute pristine and innocence. I can't even imagine uh, what a person would look like that was in complete innocence. The only thing I can think about is, you know, your child, you know, child has innocence and they don't understand certain things. And I actually use that throughout the study, uh, different examples of, of children um, in, in their innocence. Like if you say, don't touch the fire, it's hot. In their innocence, they don't know what that means, but they do understand I shouldn't touch that, but they don't understand the whole ramification that if they touch it, they'll get burned. I think the same is true with Adam and Eve. I think they understood right from wrong. They understood I'm not supposed to eat that, but they didn't understand the whole ramifications that if I eat, I will die. What's death? I mean, they, the whole concept of death they hadn't understood. Um, so it's absolute pristine. That's also the garden. Everything was in innocence. Everything was pure. Everything was lovely. Number nine, though capable of suffering. Adam and Eve were completely capable of suffering. They were not incapable. Otherwise, there would be no suffering. So A is loneliness. They were capable of experience, isolation, and loneliness, as we'll see in chapter three this week. B, they were dependent on God, upon God for all, and they were completely under the authority of God. So when you push away from that authority, you push away from the commandment that he gives, do not eat or you will die, they're capable now of suffering because they were completely dependent on God. They're capable of disobedience, as we will see. And unfortunately, they were capable of death. When you eat, you will surely die. But again, they had no idea that that what that would look like and what that would feel like. When God sees his creation, I love this, he says it's good, but when he sees human life, he says it's very good. God's creation is good. There's no blemish or mistake. I just, I love the way that the author writes that, that everything that he makes, he said, oh, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then, he makes man, and he says it's very good. Which also shows, I think, an importance between animals and humans. Not that I'm against, you know, animals at all, um, but I think when we tend to elevate them at the same significance and the same importance as human life, I think there's a problem with that. You know, God created us in his image. He says it's very good, and animals are not created in the image of God. Um, number one, pleasing in the eyes of the one who calls it good. This is a point of reference. God defines what is good. It is his standard alone. Do we view this good from God's perspective, from God's eyes? We need to view things from his perspective. A lot of times I think that we, we tend to say what's good and what's not good. We don't see things through his perspective. But being created in the image of God is very good. And also I think that kind of translate with um, the way that we look at human life. You know, our culture looks at human life a little bit differently than the church looks at human life. We say it's very good. They say, mm, maybe it's not as good because it's not as human. Number two, pur purposeful design in good order. He made everything with order. And everything that he created is uh, praiseworthy for God without flaw or blemish. So let's talk a little bit about the term good. I'm going to read a couple references here. So what what is it? How do we see it uh, throughout scripture? Good is the opposite of evil. Good is the opposite of evil. I'm going to look up really quickly. Proverbs 31 12. 
And the, the, the passages I'm using is the same type of good that's used in Genesis 2. She does good, or sorry, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life, talking about the Proverbs 31 woman. She does him good. She doesn't do evil. It shows the, the opposite. The good is the opposite of evil. Two, good is also shalom, which means peace in Hebrew. Shalom is used as wholeness or health. In Jeremiah, let's see, in Jeremiah 8.15, We waited for peace, but no good came. So kind of showing the opposite again. We waited for peace, we waited for good, but no good came. It shows this idea that good is also synonymous with peace. And then I'm just going to look at the last one, um, Psalm 105. Exalt the Lord our God. Oops, no, wrong one. That's so good. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Paradise is the life it ought to be. It is the ought to be. This is how it should be. This is how it was. In paradise, there is life and no death. There is fellowship with God unhindered, complete communion, complete fellowship. Just take a minute and just think about that. What would it be like to have complete dependence upon God where he's fully present here, where you can just like talk with him? There's no sin in your life. There's no fear of death. There's no suffering. He's created everything for life for you. You're in complete relationship with others or with your spouse. I mean, it's just like this environment that is perfection, that is innocence. It's the way it ought to be. As we kind of close a little bit with just the beginning of this study, I wanted to set up the study looking at what paradise was and what it will look like one day. Too many times I get stuck in the here and the now and the aches and the pains and the sadness and the sorrow. You know, I work with adolescent boys um, during the week. I work at um, a couple different group homes in Fresno. And these kids are, um, well, they're psychotic. <laughs> And uh, they've had a completely rough, rough life. To say a rough life doesn't even compare, but very abusive childhoods. And, and so when I go in every week and I hear, you know, because we're trying, just trying to fix a little bit of their behaviors just so that they can be a law-abiding citizen. That's all we want them to be. But of course, I want so much more for them. Because when I see their suffering, and I drive back home, and I, I think about my life, and I think about Emma and Rick, my mind sometimes goes to paradise. It goes back to the way it ought to have been, and the way that it will be in the future. When all the heartache, and the pain, and the abuse, and the neglect, will be justly handled and will be washed away. My prayer for these boys ultimately is that they will know the same peace, the same shalom, the same hope that we have. That their suffering will not just be, as they always say, well, that's just normal. That's just the way it was, lady. <laughs> you know, it's just normal to me that that won't be the norm anymore. It will be eradicated. So it's in those moments that I have to pause and I have to look at the ought to be. 
And it makes the sadness in my heart for these boys and the sadness in my heart for my own suffering and for your suffering, it makes it a little less when I think about what it will be. That it's not just what it, what it was, but what it will be in the future. The only way to have paradise on earth is to have communion with God. That's a quote by Dr. Finch. The only way to have paradise on earth is to have communion with God. In the Garden of Eden, they were naked and they were unashamed. If you want paradise now, it begins with communion with God. The times that I have the most peace in my life, regardless of my circumstances, are the times that I have sweet fellowship and sweet communion with our Savior. And so I just kind of wanted to paint that picture for you. Um, again, this week, we're kind of get, we're going to be camped out in Genesis 2, but more we're going to be camped out in Genesis 3, looking at, okay, let's take a deep breath, because here is where suffering began. And when I look at it through, this is the way it ought to have been, it makes suffering like, oh, it's the choice they made that caused all this to happen. This wasn't how it was meant to be. I was never meant to suffer. I was never meant to have my eyes open to the knowledge of good and evil. This was not the way that I was created to be. And it kind of gives me a little bit of hope and peace knowing that. And God is through it all, and he is with us all. So I'm going to go ahead and close us. And I have a few discussion questions. Maybe you've kind of already talked a little bit about them earlier, but um, I want you to be able to discuss them in your group. So the first one is, what are the ways you have viewed suffering? And be honest. Be, be honest. No. Uh, is there any... Oh, sorry. That, sorry, this is a really bad sentence. Um, is there any difference that you see between Christian suffering and non-Christian suffering? That was the question Carol gave. So do you see the way that Christians suffer and the way that non-Christians suffer any different? And how have you approached suffering? If suffering happens in your life, how do you approach it? Do you, are you like an ostrich where you kind of bury your head in the sand and don't want to think about it? Or if your friend is suffering, how do you deal with that? How do you approach it? Do you come alongside or kind of shine away? And just be honest with it. So let me go ahead and close us in prayer, and I'll let you kind of discuss this. And again, this week you'll go through that packet. Um, next week when we come back, we'll discuss what you, you wrote down, some of your thoughts, and then I'll do the next topic. Um, so, and then you'll, you'll get your next packet for next week. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that you are in control of all. That nothing, and not what Adam and Eve did in the garden surprised you. Nothing was out in left field for you, Lord. You, you knew what was going to happen, and you knew ultimately, Father, that you would send your son to die on a cross to experience the death and the suffering that you warned against so that our suffering and our death will one day be eliminated. I thank you for that. I thank you that you are a kind and gracious Father. And I pray, Lord, as we continue this adventure, as we continue to search your word for what this idea, what this reality of suffering looks like, that we will come away comforted and what it will be in the future. We thank you for this time. We pray all these things to you, Father, through your Son, Jesus, and by your Holy Spirit. Amen.